Okay, hi everyone, welcome back to this video series on data centers switching services. Unlike bridges which use software to create and manage a filter table, switches use application specific integrated circuits or ASICs to build and maintain their filter tables. But it's still okay to think of a layer 2 switch as a type of multi port bridge because their basic reason for being is the same to break up collision domains. Layer 2 switches and bridges are faster than routers because they don't take up time by looking at the network layer header information. Instead, they look at the frame's hardware address before deciding to forward flood or drop the frame. <coughs> And unlike hubs, switches create private dedicated collision domains and provide independent bandwidth on each port. Layer 2 switching provides the following hard based bridging ASICs, wire speed, low latency, low cost. What makes layer 2 switching so efficient is that no modification to the data packet takes place. The device only reads the frame encapsulation in the packet, which makes the switching process considerably faster and less error prone than routing processes are. And if you use layer 2 switching for both workgroup connectivity and network segmentation, thereby breaking up collision domains, you can create more network segments than you can with traditional routed networks. Plus, Layer 2 switching increases bandwidth for each user because again each interface into the switch is its own collision domain. We'll delve deeper into the layer 2 switching technology soon. Limitations of layer 2 switching. Since layer 2 switching is commonly placed in the same category as bridged networks are, it's easy to assume that it has the same hang-ups and issues that bridged networks do, but switches and bridges are still different devices and while bridges can be appropriate when integrated into a network correctly keeping their limitations in mind is critical for a solid well-functioning network while bridged networks break up collision domains remember that the network is still one large broadcast domain and neither layer 2 switches nor bridges will break up broadcast domains by default this not only limits your network size and growth potential, it can also reduce its overall performance. Think about growth broadcast and multicast along with slow convergence time of legacy spanning trees can slow your network's performance to a crawl as it extends to handle new demands. This is where ne Nexus switches really shine. The advanced NX OS allows us to replace many of the routers we used to employ in our internet work while my mitigating the convergence times and times issues and other problems the older switches presented bridging versus LAN switching many people think of layer 2 switches as glorified bridges that just give us a lot more ports but while the switch is conceptually and functionality similar to a multi-port bridge, here are some differences and similarities you should always keep in mind. Bridges are software based, while switches are hardware based, using ASICs chips to help make filtering decisions. There can only be one spanning tree instance per bridge, but switches can have many. I'll cover spanning trees in a bit. Most switches have more ports than most bridges do. Both bridges and switches flood layer, broad, layer 2 broadcasts. Both bridges and switches learn MAC addresses by examining the source address of each frame received. Both bridges and switches make forwarding decisions based on layer 2 addresses. The three key switch functions of layer 2. Layer 2 switching involves three distinct functions that are really important for you to remember. Address discovery and retention. Layer 2 switches remember the source hardware address of each frame received on an interface and enter this information into Mac database called forward filter table. Forward 
filter decisions. When a frame received when a frame is received on an interface, the switch analyzes the destination hardware address to determine the appropriate exit interface in the Mac database. The frame will be forwarded out only an appropriate destination port loop prevention. If multiple connections between switches are created for redundancy purposes, network loops can occur. Spanning tree protocol STP is used to stop network loops while still permitting redundancy for fault tolerance. With the basics of our key tree in mind, let's delve deeper into them now. Address discovery and retention. When the switch is first powered on, the Mac forward table is empty as shown in figure 11.1. When an interface receives a frame, the switch places the frame's um, source address in the Mac forward filter table, allowing it to remember which interface the sending device is located on. The switch then has no choice but to flood the network with this frame out every port except the source port it has no idea where the destination device is actually located this broadcast is actually an attempt to discover the frame's origin if another device answers this broadcast flood and sends the frame a frame back then the switch will take the source address from that frame and place that mac address into its database as well here after associating the address with the interface that received the frame since the switch now as both of the relevant mac addresses in its filtering table the two devices can now make a point-to-point -point connection the switch doesn't need to flood the frame as it did the first time because now the frames can and will be forwarded only between these two specific devices this exact this is exactly the thing that makes layer 2 switches better than hubs. When you've got hubs at the helm, all frames will be forwarded out all ports every time. Figure 11 1 shows how switches build a Mac database. Here you can see four holes attached to a switch. When the switch is powered on, there's nothing in its Mac address forward filter table. But when the hosts start communicating, things begin to change. The switch places the source hardware address of each frame into a table along with the port which the frame's source address corresponds. Figure 11.2 demonstrates how, to, how a forward filter table is populated. There are four steps to this process. One, host A sends a frame to host B Host A's MAC address is 0000.8C01.000A. Host B's MAC address is 0000.8C01.000B. The switch receives the frame on the E0 slash 0 interface and places the source address in the MAC address table. Since the destination address isn't in the MAC database, the frame is forwarded out all interfaces except the source port. Host B receives the frame and responds to host A. The switch receives this frame on interface E0 slash 1 and places at the source hardware address in the MAC database. Host A and host B can now make a point-to-point -point connection and only these two specific devices will receive the frames involved in that communication. Host C and D won't see these frames and their MAC addresses won't be found in the database either because they haven't yet sent a frame to the switch. If host A and host B don't communicate to the switch again within a certain amount of time, the switch will flush their entries from the database in effort to keep its keep it as current as possible. Forward filter decisions. When a frame receives when a frame arrives at a switch interface, the destination hardware address is compared to the forward 
filter MAC address the database if the destination hardware address is known and therefore listed in the database the frame will be sent out only the correct exit interface the switch will transmit the frame out only the destination interface which preserves the bandwidth on the net on the other network segments and is called frame filtering but if the destination hardware address isn't listed in the mac database then the frame will be flooded out all active interfaces except the one that the frame was received on if a device answers the flood frame the mac database is updated with the device's location its interface so again by default when a host or server sends a broadcast out on the lan the switch will respond by flooding the frame out all active ports except the source port remember although the switch creates smaller collision domains a network is still one large broadcast domain check out figure 11 tree in it host a sends a data frame to host d Here's what our switch will do when it receives a frame from host A. Since host A's MAC address is not in the forward filter table, the switch will add the source address and port to the MAC address table and then forward the frame to host D. As you know by now, if host D's MAC address wasn't already in the forward filter table, the switch would have flooded the frame out all ports except for port FA0 slash 3. Let's take a look at the basic output of an iOS based switch to make sure you've got this foundational concept nailed down before we move to NXOS. The command on both iOS and NX is shown is show MAC address table. Let's say our switch receives a frame the following MAC address source MAC address 0005.dccb.d74d destination MAC address 000af467.9e 8c how will it handle this frame if you answered that because the switch already has the destination mac address in its mac address table the frame will be forwarded out f a 0 slash 3 only vlan basics by default routers allow broadcasts to occur only within the originating network while switches forward broadcast broadcast to all segments the reason is it's called a flat network is because it's made up of only one broadcast domain not because the actual design is physically flat figure 11 4 illustrates this typical flat network architecture with layer 2 switched networks are typically designed in this kind of configuration every broadcast packet that's transmitted will be seen by every device on the network regardless of whether the device needs to receive the data or not take a look in figure 11 4 you can see host a sending out a broadcast an l3 port on all switches forwarding except for one that originally received it now check out figure 11.5 it pictures switched network and shows host a sending a frame with host d as its destination the key factor that's important to note here is that the frame is forwarded out not only where host d is located this is a huge improvement over old hub networks i'm pretty sure it's clear by now that the biggest benefit a layer 2 switch network gives you is that it creates individual collision domain segments for each device plugged into each port on the switch this scenario frees us from ethernet density constraints allowing us to build much larger networks this is all good but as usual each new advance comes with new issues relevant to the scenario here is that large is that the larger the number of users and devices on the network the more broadcasts and packets each switch must handle and then there's the 
ambiguous security factor which happens to be particularly troublesome within typical layer 2 switch into network issues arise from the fact that by default all users can see every device and you can't stop devices from broadcasting or users from trying to respond to broadcast this means your security options are dismally limited by to placing passwords on your servers or other devices the answer to this dilemma is the magnificent magnificent vlan which solves an abundance of problems associated with layer 2 switching here's a short list of ways vlans simplified network management network address migrations and other changes are made significantly less painful by just configuring a port into the appropriate VLAN. A group of users requiring an unusually high level of security can be corralled into a separate VLAN so that outside users can communicate with them. VLANs are independent from their physical or geographic locations because they are functionally logical. VLANs greatly enhance security. VLANs increase the number of broadcast domains while decreasing their size. Coming up I'm going to tell you all about switching characteristics and thoroughly describe how switches provide us with better network services than hubs. Broadcast control. Broadcasts occur in almost every protocol but how often they occur depends upon three things the type of control the applications running on the internet network how these services are used some older applications have been rewritten to reduce their bandwidth consumption but ever but the ever increasing amount of multimedia applications that use both broadcasts and multicasts extensively create a huge burden fault to equipment inadequate segmentation and poorly designed firewalls seriously compound the problems generated by these broadcast intensive applications all of this has brought network design to a whole new level while presenting a host of new challenges for an administrator this means that it's never been more important to ensure that your network is properly segmented so you can quickly isolate a single segment's problems and prevent them from propagating through the internet work the most effective way to do that is through strategic switching and routing over the last decade as switches became more affordable more companies replaced their flat hub networks with pure switched networks and vlan environments all devices within a vlan are members of the same broadcast domain and receive all broadcasts by default these broadcasts are filtered from all ports on the switch that aren't members of the same vlan this is great because you get all the benefits you would with a switched design without getting hit with all the problems you'd have if all you your users were in the same broadcast domain security there's always a catch though right time to get back to those security issues a flat internet work security used to be tackled by connecting hubs and switches together with routers so it was basically the routers job to maintain security this arrangement was pretty ineffective for several reasons first anyone connecting to the physical network could access the network resources located on particular physical LAN. second anyone had second all anyone had to do to observe any and all traffic happening in the network was to plug a network analyzer into the hub and similar to the last scary fact users could join a work group by just plugging their network stations into an existing hub not exactly secure but that's exactly what makes vlan so cool if you build them and create multiple broadcast groups you have total control over each port and user so the days when anyone could just plug their workstations into any switch port and gain access to network resources are history because you now get to control each port plus whatever resources that port can access and the good news doesn't end there because vlans can be created in accordance 
with network resources at given user requires plus switches can be configured to inform a network management station of any unauthorized access to network resources and if you need inter VLAN communication you can implement restrictions on a router to make sure that happens securely. You can also place restrictions on hardware addresses, protocols and applications. Flexibility and scalability if you are paying attention so far you know that layer 2 switches only read frames for filtering this is because they don't check the network layer protocol and by default switches forward broadcast to all ports but if you create and implement vlans you're essentially creating smaller broadcast domains at layer 2 this means that broadcasts sent out from a node in one vlan won't be forwarded to ports configured to belong to a different VLAN so by assigning switch ports or users to VLAN groups on a switch or a group of connected switches you gain the flexibility to add only users you want into that broadcast domain regardless of their physical location. This setup can also work to block broadcast storms caused by a faulty network interface card NIC as well as preventing an intermediate device from propagating broadcast storms throughout the entire network. Those evils can still happen on the specific VLAN where the problem originated but the disease will be effectively contained so that particular VLAN um, another advantage is when a VLAN gets too big you can create more of them to keep the broadcast from consuming too much bandwidth. Always remember the fewer users in a VLAN the fewer users affected by broadcast. This is all good but you really need to keep network services in mind. You have and have a solid understanding of how users connect to these services when you create your VLAN. To understand how a VLAN looks to a switch, it's helpful to begin by looking at a traditional network. Figure 11.6 illustrates how a network was created using hubs to connect physical LANs to a router. Here you can see that each network is attached with a hub port to the router make a note to self that each segment also has its own logical network number even though this isn't obvious when looking at the figure moving on each node attached to a particular physical network has to match the network number in order to be able to communicate on the internet work each department has its own LAN so if you need to add new users to let say sales you would just plug them into the sales LAN and automatically include them in the sales collision and broadcast domain this design really did work well for many years but there was one major flaw what happens if the hub for sales is full and we need to add another user into the sales LAN or what do we do if there's no more physical space where the sales team is located for this new employee if the answer is simply stick the new sales member over on the same side of the building as the finance people and plug them in because there's room Doing this would obviously make the new user part of the finance LAN, which is very bad for many reasons. First and foremost, we now have a major security problem because the new sales employee is a member of the finance broadcast domain. Our newbie can openly see all the same servers and freely access the potentially sensitive network services that the finance folks can. The second issue is for this user to access the appropriate sales network services they actually do need to do their job and they would have to go through the router to log into the sales server which is not exactly efficient now let's look at a switch which accomplishes for us figure 117 shows how switches totally solve our problems by removing the physical boundary and demonstrates how six VLANs number 2 through 7 are used to create a broadcast domain for each apartment. Each switch port is then administratively 
assigned a VLAN membership depending on the host and which broadcast domain is to be placed in. So now if we need to add another user to the sales VLAN 7 we can simply assign the port to VLAN 7 regardless of where the new sales team member is physically located. This illustrates one of the greatest advantages of designing your network with VLANs over the old collapsed backbone design. Now notice that I started assigning VLANs with VLAN 2. The number is actually irrelevant but you might be wondering what happened to VLAN 1. Well that LAN is an administrative VLAN and even though it can be used for a work group, Cisco recommends that you use it for administrative purposes only. You shouldn't ever delete or change the name of VLAN 1 and by default all ports on the switch are members of VLAN 1 until you change them. Look at figure 117 again because each VLAN is considered a broadcast domain. It must also have its own subnet number and if you're using IPv6 then each VLAN must be assigned to its own IPv6 network number. So you don't get confused, just keep thinking of VLANs as separate subnets or even separate networks. Now let's go back to that because of switches we don't need routers anymore misconception referring to figure 11 7 notice that there are seven vlans or broadcast domains counting vlan 1 the nodes within each vlan communicate with each other but not with anything in a different vlan because the nodes in any given vlan think that they're actually in a class backbone as illustrated back in figure 11.6 so we use so what do we use to enable the host in figure 11.7 to communicate to a node or host on a different VLAN you guessed it a router those nodes absolutely must go through a router or some other layer 3 device just as they do when they are configured for internet or communication as shown in figure 11.6 it works the exact same way it would if we were trying to connect different physical networks. Communication between VLANs must go through a layer 3 device. Um, so I'm going to leave it here today for this video. If you like listening, please consider like, sharing and subscribing. Thank you.